Hey friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Wendy and I am with Inspire Ministries and I'm so glad that you have landed on today's video. Today is just going to be a short lesson in the book of 1 John. So if you do not already have your Bibles, go get it. As always, I want you to see in print for yourself what these words say. Now, as always, I am reading from my primary study Bible, which is the New Living Translation. So with that caveat being already mentioned, you might have a Bible that looks differently. You might have an ESV, a New King James. It doesn't really matter as long as you have your own study Bible, your own Bible that you use on a regular basis, because I really want you to see this. Now, I have been in 1 John for a while. I have heard pastors throughout the years give explanations as to how they study scripture for themselves. And one pastor that I have followed for a number of years has been a very reputable source for me over the years. And what he has done, he has often studied one book of the Bible all of the way through from start to finish, and he's read it 30 times. 30 times. So he said that when he first started reading scripture to teach, he started reading one book and that was 1 John. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John he read all of the time and he said that he did that until he read each of those books 30 times and then went to different books in the Bible and did the exact same thing. So I thought, you know what, I want to do that same thing and I love John, I love 1st John and so I wanted to do that or at least to see if I could do that. So I've been in John, not 30 times, but I've been in 1 John now for a couple weeks and I've read it on repeat a few different times and I love it. It is so good and it's so powerful and I do have some notes that I am going to be reading from, some notes that I took about my experience through this particular verse that we're going to talk about today and that is specifically 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. But before we get there, I want to talk about what he is speaking about in this particular text, because I think it's really important for us to get a clear idea of what John is speaking of. So in 1 John, chapter 3, he is speaking of living as children of God. I'm going to read some of the excerpts from John, chapter 3, just so that you can get an idea of what he is teaching in this moment. He says, now this, in, first, in verse 1, again, 1 John, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. He goes on to say, but the people who belong to the world don't recognize that we are God's children because we don't, I'm sorry, because they don't know him. So he's setting this up as we are children of God and those who do not belong to him, those who are not children of God, do not recognize that we are children of God because they don't know him, right? So they don't know him and because we look like him, they don't know us, right? They can't recognize us because they cannot recognize that we belong to him because they don't know him. He goes on to say uh, in verse two, dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, glory to God, right? For we will see him as he really is. Then he says in verse 3, and all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure as he is pure, right? As he is pure. Then he goes on, let's see, a few more verses later, he says in verse 7, he says, dear, dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Then he says in verse 8, but when people keep on sinning, because remember, he's trying to identify us as children of God right? And he has to differentiate between the ones who are like him and the ones who aren't. And so in this moment, he is, he is pointing out what the ones who don't look like Jesus, who don't belong to God, look like. He says, but when people keep on sinning, 
It shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. Okay, sometimes in an effort to know what someone is, we need to know the counterfeit. We need to know the opposite. Who, who is this person not? Well, a child of God is someone who doesn't continue to sin. Someone who doesn't continue to keep on sinning because in the way of, uh, in the way where they keep on sinning, they are actually proving that they belong to the devil. Those are harsh words that John uses, but it's truth. How many know that the truth often are those hard words that are hard to read, right? They're hard to read because they get in our face. They, they, they oppose our, our fleshly human nature. He goes on to say, but the son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Then here is this verse, and it's the one that I want to land on for today. And, and trust me, when I first read this, after I was like, when I was first reviewing 1 John again, I thought to myself, wow. I mean, I remember reading this, but I don't remember how powerful it actually was. So let me read it to you. Out of the New Living Translation, it says, Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because, there's a key word, that's a conditional key word. For those of you who've been watching my videos for a while now, you know what those key conditional words are because God's life is in them. Pause for a moment. Let's read that again. Those who have been born into God's family, those who have given themselves to Christ, those who are now children of God, those who will experience the kingdom of God, right? Those who are living with salvation, they are living with Christ. Those who have been born into, that's that new birth, that, that's where we get that phrase born again. Those who have been born into God's family do what? They do not make a what? A practice of sinning because God's life is in them. Goes on to say, so there's another conditional phrase. For those of you who've been around for a while, you know that one of the conditional words or phrases is so or so that. And this is a conditional phrase that we have to pay attention to. He says, so, like, because of that, the reason for that, so they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. Those who have been born into God's family, born again, they are regenerated. They have been given new life. They do not practice sin sinning. They do not make it a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. But it, it's even more than that. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. Wow. Wow. And yet, you and I, many of us in our life, maybe it, it's not how we would act now, but at least probably at some point in our life, if not now, we would argue with this and we would say, I'm not perfect. I sin all of the time, every day. I hear this all of the time. Well, I'm not perfect. I am not Jesus. I will never be him. I will never live my life like him. I sin all the time. I was born a sinful person. It's, I'm a human. It's in my human nature to sin, right? We say this. And, and more than that, we hear this in our Christian circles even all the time. And you know, while I believe that's true, and it is true, we are sinful by nature. We were born sinful. We were born with this innate desire to sin and this habitual practice to sin. While I think that this is true, I think sometimes we use this one line as a means of getting out of any sort of responsibility. I think that we do. 
me included. We think somehow this gets us off the hook for simply being a sinful person or being imperfect. We say things, well, I'm not perfect, so fill in the blank. And usually that fill in the blank is sinful. Well, you know, I'm not perfect, so I swear every now and then. Well, you know, I'm not perfect, so I get drunk a lot with my friends or on occasion with my friends. Well, I'm not perfect, you know, so I am going to gossip about people. You know, I'm not perfect, so, I, you know, I am going to compromise in this area of my life. We don't say that, but the thing often that we put in place of that is a sinful thing. Well, I'm not perfect. You can't expect perfection from me. I'm not Jesus. All that's doing is keeping us with this bitter, self-entitled attitude that is actually keeping us far from the Lord. It's actually causing us a spiritual setback and we don't even realize it. It can be a dangerous place to be for too long, right? If you have this attitude, if you walk around with this chip on your shoulder all of the time, then in no way, shape, or form are you acting like Jesus. Are you behaving like Jesus? And while he realizes that we are not perfect, you and I need to be walking in righteousness. We need to be, as the Beatitude says in Matthew 5, we need to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We have to be like uh, John 6, that says, seek first the kingdom of God and live righteously and all these things will be added unto you. Jesus says, be like me, follow me. The scriptures say, be holy because I am holy. It says this in Le Leviticus 11. And then Peter reminds us this in 1 Peter. Behold, be holy because he is holy. It's the pursuit of our days. It's the, it's the reason why we read the scriptures so that we can understand not only just his love for us and his grace for us and this, this great story of this great man named Jesus, but also to know how we are to live our lives every single day. And it's the, it's the foundation of my ministry. I want to be clear about what scripture says on how we are to live our life. Why? Because I want to know for me, how I can live more holy and righteous and pure and godly. The fact of the matter is, those things have gotten so lost in translation among our Christian circles that even the world views those character traits as negative things. Oh, you think you're holier than thou. You think you're better than me. Oh, you're righteous and pure. These have been... These, these have been taught by our Christian circles to the world as to be looked at as something negative. And it's not because scripture teaches that if we believe in Jesus, if we are a follower of him, if we trust his word, if we are seeking after holiness and righteousness, we have to pursue a life that le that lives more like Jesus, that has more, that has character traits that look like Christ. It's the goal of our Christian life to look more like Jesus, right? And no, we will never get it fully right. No, we will never be perfect like him. That's not the point. Perfection isn't the point. This ongoing desire and this ongoing pursuit of righteousness and holiness is the desire. It is the aim. It is the goal. It's the game that it's the it's the goal this side of heaven, right? It's the aim for the believer. Look at these verses. James 4:17 says this in the ESV. Because it's in a different translation, I wrote it down in my notes. James 4, 17 in the ESV says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. It is a sin. So again, we don't practice sinning. When we know something, when we know the truth, when we have been exposed to the truth, when we experience the joy of our salvation, 
When we read the scriptures and we and we get a grasp of how we are to live, we are without excuse for doing the thing that we know. Right? It's 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 we have to we have to grow in our knowledge. We have to grow in our relationship with Jesus. Luke 12:48 in the NLT says this, but someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly, okay? When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. When you and I, when you and I sit in sermon messages at church every single week, when we read our Bible, when we sit in small groups, when we go to Bible classes and we learn all of these wonderful truths of scripture, we cannot be left unchanged. It has to change us. It has to alter our heart. We cannot go around practice, practicing sinning. It's not possible. Listen, we know better. As a result, we must do better. Now, let's get to the heart of my message today because this is something that I do not want you to miss out on. So I pray that you will watch the totality of this right up to the end. I don't have much long uh, to, to, to get this out. I just have a few more minutes with you. I want to look at this verse a little closer, right? Specifically, the line that says they can't keep on sinning. Now, you and I would argue, well, yes, we can. Yes, we can, because we, we, we can argue all day long that we sin all the time. And back to that, I am not perfect, I sin all the time attitude, right? But the scripture says, let's go back and read it again. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. This word can is this Greek word, dynatsi, D-Y-N-A-T-S-I, dynatsi. And it means this, to will, to will, the ability to do what is possible and practicable. Wow, I love this. So the word can in the Greek, which is the word dynatsi, means to will, and it's the, having the ability to do what is possible and practicable. In other words, we can do what is possible and we can practice that which is possible. So the opposite of dinatsai, because it's this word can't, is this, to refuse to exercise the power that you have to will to do something that is absolutely possible and practicable. Yikes. That that kind of hurts a little bit, right? So when he says that you can't go on sinning, that you can't keep on sinning, what he is saying is, by saying that you can't do something, you are saying that you refuse to exercise the power you have to will to do something that is absolutely possible and practicable. It is saying, I can, I can go on and no longer sin. It is possible and it's practicable that I will get control over my sin-filled life. That I will because it's an act of the will, I will follow him. I will trust him. I will be a new man. I will be defined by being a new creature. I will let go of my old man. I will let go of my old sinful nature. I will be a new person. I will live with a renewed mind, right? I will, because it is the power and the will to do something that is absolutely possible and practicable. So when he says you can't keep on sinning, what he is saying is that you have no longer within you the ability to do that thing. 
You are a new person. You have been created into a new person. And so you no longer have a desire to do that. You no longer, you know, listen, I have many people who I know who have recently, in recent years, given their life to Christ. And they're like, wow, I didn't realize how ugly the world was until I gave my life to Jesus. I didn't realize how devastating my life was before I met Jesus. And now I am, I am living with this renewed power, not just this enthusiasm, not just this joy and this peace, but with this renewed passion, this renewed ability, this renewed, renewed power and strength to live free from the sin that I was so trapped in before. I didn't realize that I was a slave to that sin, right? I didn't realize that I was a slave to that sin. And so this is powerful. This is powerful for us to get. Oftentimes, I want to suggest to you, it's hard, but oftentimes it's not that we can't do something. It's that we won't because doing something is an act. Being, 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 being that we can do something is an act of the will. It is, it is something that we choose to do. That's why they say all the time in marriage, marriage is a choice. You choose to love. You make this active choice to love your spouse, to love your neighbor, to love your family members, right? You make it an act of the will. I can do it. I can do it. So you can, as equally as it says that you can't go on sinning, you can live in the freedom of that sin. You can. It is possible and it is practicable. And God expects it from you and I. So I hope that you have enjoyed this little mini lesson through 1 John chapter 3 today. I have loved being with you today. I would love your feedback. I would love to know what you are studying, where you are reading in your Bible. I would love to know how the Lord is growing you in your faith. I love that you are here. I love that you choose to spend time with me in these videos. I know some of them are much longer than others, and I always appreciate your time. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. It helps me out more than you know and you know what else is helpful for you to hit that notification bell to be notified for every time that I upload content just like this that way you do not miss another video that I have coming up and trust me I have a lot of content coming up in the next few months I love you and until my next video I pray that you have an awesome day with Jesus bye friend